الأخوة مساء الخير مرة أخرى هذه جلسة الختامية Good afternoon again This is the final session of today's conference and uh, all day we've been discussing the legal aspect demographic aspects, geographical aspects, the ramifications of this decision. This session will be focusing on the ways and means of uh, confronting this decision and once what strategies can be used, what choices are available to Palestinians to stand up to this decision. There is a number of requests I have had and who, who participants who wanted to speak. I will start with Dr. Anis Al Qasim. Please do not take more than three minutes for each intervention to allow as many participants as possible to participate. Dr. Anis, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, I think we are faced with a very tough bulldozer represented by the United States of America. For this reason, facing up to this bulldozer can be through one of two legal uh, ways. As long as they announced uh, yesterday that they intend to move the embassy on the 14th of May to coincide with the occasion of the 70th anniversary of the establishment of the Zionist entity, then this indicates that there is a real intent and a translation of this intent into reality, and it's not just an, an, an announcement. In this case, we can seek the International Court of Justice to, to so that we can get a ruling that the United States will be part and parcel of the aggression committed against the Palestinian people. The second way, and that is the, United, the American president resorted to a mythical uh, words or statements by referring to what is known as the Jewish people, and in the United States, there are laws which say that the international laws are part and parcel of American national law, so maybe we can <coughs> engage legal experts in the United States to see if it's possible at all to take uh, action against the American president to the effect that in <coughs> moving his embassy to Jerusalem, he is taking part in aggression against the Palestinian people. Can we ask a question, please? Simple question. This business of the embassy, the embassy is in West Jerusalem. It's not in no man's land, it's not in East Jerusalem anywhere. Legally, will this be, well, does this amount to, amount to, it's, it's just uh, uh, establishing an embassy where the, where the consulate is, is this only a question of recognizing Jerusalem as capital, or is there something that I fail to understand? 
Yes, your question is a good one. The United States international commitment from 19. 47 that uh, the Jerusalem is both at separata, it has no change. So they have uh, uh, and uh, any credentials are presented to the consulate. Is, so this has no change. Please, anyone who wants to intervene, just to raise their hands. Please. Thank you very much. I think the actual physical uh, move of the embassy to West Jerusalem or East Jerusalem is also a formality, and it summarizes all the the what the contents of the announcement in December 2017 and also we thereby we are it's incumbent upon us to have a strategy to deal with this question and from 1948 to 76 to now the announcement came as a confirmation and legalization and legitimization of the Israeli policies. So in order to be more comprehensive, we must look for a strategy to face up to Israeli policies vis-a-vis -vis Jerusalem. We hear some proposals. We do not have any magic wand to, to solve this problem and also there is no one single solution the israeli project or the judaization of jerusalem started from 1948 today we've seen many manifestations of this project and therefore this is a complete comprehensive project and we cannot face it except through an alternative project layered. I tried in my paper, tried to go through that, but I didn't have enough time. And maybe I can go back to these levels. In, in Jerusalem today, Israel really surrounds Jerusalem and lays siege to it geographically, culturally, and the Palestinian presence are only Palestinians only available to citizens of Israel and those Palestinians who have the residency or blue card. The official Palestinian presence is very limited, especially after Oslo Agreement in 1993 and the designation of Jerusalem as a final status. Uh, Case. Uh, so therefore, any Palestinian political activity inside Jerusalem was closed down, like the Orient House and others. And today, people who live in Jerusalem know that any Palestinian activity is limited to some international organizations and uh, uh, some Israeli legal uh, establishments, uh, so therefore uh, 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 we must uh, go back to re-establishing Palestinian civil society organizations inside uh, Jerusalem to raise awareness of the pressing issues and to re-establish some sort of collective action in, in the city and also some uh, economic projects to enhance the ability of the Palestinians to withstand this Israeli pressures. And also the political parties inside Israel and uh, also Palestinian factions and parties on the West Bank sh should work to 
reconstitute and reinstitute uh, Jerusalem as uh, an important cause because since 1993, this has been absent and we've only been dealing with Jerusalem at the level of slogans. There are no strategies, no action plans, no nothing. And therefore, we must uh, set forth uh, action plans which can face up to Israeli plans. I agree entirely with Dr. Anis. We still have some cards in our hands, although they entail some defects and problems, but they must be used. Colleagues have uh, mentioned in the last session that uh, we must look for other tracks. The legal track is one international uh, criminal court uh, because uh, settlement according to the Rome agreement is a, a, a act of uh, war crime. Maybe we can resort that and also we must uh, also activate the, the decision in 2003 which considered the, the wall as illegal in Jerusalem. And also Resolution 2334 and others which may serve the cause of the Palestinian people. And therefore we must uh, uh, adopt officially a policy and a strategy of uh, boycotting and civil resistance. Two quick notes uh, what uh, Dr. Anis has said. In the United States, there is a precedent in 2015 before the Supreme Court, where the Supreme Court ruled that those who were born in Jerusalem will, will not be registered as they they, they were born in Israel, and the High Court decided that because the foreign policy is determined by the President of the United States, and the administration did not, uh, did not uh, agree to considering uh, uh, Jerusalem as capital and part of Israel, because that would diminish the role of the United States uh, as a mediator for peace. This was in the days of the Obama administration. So if the case goes now to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court will rule based on the latest Trump decision. In the United States, there is uh, a debate as to who takes precedent, national, American national legislation or international law. So when the Trump administration wants to impose sanctions on any company, although uh, there are, uh, uh, so in summary, any legal action in the United States may not be in our favor. No. Nobody has the standing except the PLO, which represents the state of Palestine. And from our experience, we know that the PLO or the PA will not go to the international court to stand against the United States. So therefore, we don't have anybody to do that. With all due respect for what Osama has said, the president you mentioned is true, and the Supreme Court refused that and said that the president decides the foreign policy, and this uh, really annuls the decision by the Congress in 1995, uh, because the president determines foreign policy as for which takes precedent, American national law or international law is partly true, but I don't want to 
get into this uh, duality between international law and national law because there's a lot of discussion surrounding that, but there's an American law uh, called of the land warfare law. This is law, an old law, it's not new, and it bans the government of the United States of America to uh, uh, possess or do anything to harm an, an institute with a cultural or religious uh, identity in occupied countries. And we managed to use this law to annul the contract of rent that the Reagan administration, when, when they wanted to uh, build their embassy in a land endowed by the Khalili Sheikh. Uh, we can use the same law. Of course, we must consult American legal opinion to discover the possibility of, uh, of uh, appealing against this act, the president's decision before American court. Shamsuddin Kilani, I'm a researcher at the uh, Arab Center. We can say that after the current trends in the American uh, um, foreign policy have become more costly and more difficult. Uh, and it uh, reminds us once again is that Israel is not a Jewish project so much as it's a Western project which was aimed at solving the Jewish problem in the West at the expense of uh, Arab. And now American policy and the Trump administration's policy is uh, the facade of that and we must understand that and we know where it's getting its support from and also why the support through the second coming of Christ and the myths surrounding the creation of the state of Israel. The fundamental thing here is that Trump did not take his decision uh, from in a vacuum. The Arab situation in general, we are like a dead body and uh, starting from the Algerian president who is nothing but a picture, uh, the, Amer the Egyptian president, Libya, all these Arab countries. And uh, Syria now is, they take turns to, to hit and run and destroy. And, Russia is using the Shiites, America is using the Kurds, and the Shiite militias with Iran and America on the one hand, and of course the Gulf, which used to move in the past to cover this big uh, vacuum, is a ring on the finger of Trump. He creates the problems between them, and now he's trying to solve their problems. So the countries around Palestine and the Palestinian people are in a tragic situation. In view of this situation, now floating ideas about uh, a, an adventure which may burden the Palestinian people even more by encouraging them to turn against the Palestinian Authority, this is no good. We must encourage the Palestinian people to create its own parallel authority. They have a wealth of expert on information, and the Palestinian people should create a parallel, uh, a parallel uh, authority to that of Abbas without uh, coming into a collision with it and should be aimed at settlement. The Israeli settlement is the head of the snake in Palestine. This is a huge battle, and nobody needs to 
upon themselves as teachers of the Palestinian people. <coughs> I'll be talking about the confrontation means uh, in the future, and I would try, try to emphasize on its importance. Uh, first and foremost, uh, we need to understand that there has been a failure at the level of the Palestinian leadership uh, right this moment. Every time I start thinking uh, who uh, will succeed uh, Trabo Mazen after President Mahmoud Abbas, I become frustrated just trying to imagine who will be capable of replacing. And now I can ponder on the uh, size and the big catastrophe that we are facing. This is why I suggested the decentralized uh, decentralized resistance because the Palestinian Authority is currently has uh, its hands chained uh, because of uh, uh, Oslo agreement uh, and uh, it cannot take it back. The decentralization of the resistance, uh, its uh, spinal cord is uh, the elite. In my opinion, uh, the uh, uh, elite, uh, when we mention the elite, we can talk about multifaceted resistance, not only at the level of uh, the legal resistance, but also economy, media, etc. When it comes to the legal aspect, there's a lot of space for influence, uh, believe me. and. Uh, and from a legal uh, perspective, you are fighting the battle with laws. Uh, the leaders uh, of the occupying force uh, in Israel, uh, the leaders, uh, when the uh, airport, uh, uh, when the plane uh, arrives uh, to a UK airport, the military leaders. Uh, do not uh, step outside of the plane in order to avoid being arrested by the British authorities. You need, we need all the elite at uh, the regional and local level. I agree with you that uh, there is a paralysis at the level of the Arab world. This is why I want the Palestinians to lead the region uh, ha cannot take initiative because uh, they have a lot of issues to deal with. The leaders in this area need to be the Palestinians themselves and they will find the support at the level of the Arab pop people and elite in various fields. This is when it comes to the legal standpoint. If we want to talk more about uh, the resistance, the mosquito effect uh, actually can be mentioned. So the mosquito effect means that uh, when there's a mosquito in the room, you cannot sleep. You do not want to form an army to fight against the United States, but you want to annoy them uh, using uh, legal cases. Every day you bring up a case, and uh, all uh, within the boundaries of the laws, uh, whether uh, talking about Jerusalem, Dr. Anis is here and he knows and he can tell us about a lot of uh, areas that can be used uh, from a legal perspective in order to annoy them. The means of resistance uh, are countless microphone. Uh, so you need uh, to uh, have uh, 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 this effect, uh, the mosquito effect, on uh, U.S. officials. For example, you should call uh, the official uh, over and over, times and over again, in order to reach uh, your objective. When it comes to the economic aspect, it is different than the legal aspect. Uh, I was talking with my friend uh, Halil regarding the resistance, economic resistance in Jerusalem. We um, agreed that the support of sustainable, uh, sustainability in Jerusalem is really important. Uh, there's a lot of questions regarding uh, the issues of Jerusalem. Support, we do not mean be giving them money. money. So 
So microfinancing uh, uh, new startups is very important, uh, and microfinancing uh, was very successful all over the world. Muhammad Yunus in Bangladesh and several other examples that were capable of changing a current situation into a better situation through microfinancing. Our brothers and sisters from Jerusalem, they know that microfinancing and supporting startups uh, is really important uh, as an ease in order to guarantee the resistance uh, of the uh, residents of Jerusalem. In addition to that, uh, Miskovich, who buys uh, real estates, how many of Miskovich uh, we have in the Arab world? We have hundreds and thousands of Miskovich who are capable of buying uh, uh, real estate and they are rich, they are wealthy. Miskovich uh, who buys real estate in uh, Jerusalem is, uh, we are capable if we form this Palestinian elite supported by the Arab uh, world, you can actually create such a campaign in order to compete in terms of buying real estate and uh, supporting real estates that are already existing in uh, the Pal in uh, Jerusalem. If you are waiting uh, for President Mahmoud Abbas to do it, Abu Mazen, you need to rethink everything. The Palestinian Authority cannot provide this. Uh, and when it comes to the media aspect, the digital resistance is key, is very important, digital resistance. Uh, um, I don't want uh, to talk about uh, 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 the details. However, Israel, we know that they have trained uh, media experts. I have been following up. Uh, I have seen articles that allow uh, comments, and I can see that for every article written uh, regarding the Palestinian cause, I see the comments. I follow the comments. I follow the pages, and I see that most of them are fake. So there are armies, uh, electronic armies, uh, and, uh, for example, uh, if the Politico that sometimes sides with the Palestinian cause uh, issue a publication or an article uh, supporting the Palestinian cause, you see them attacked by this digital army. So the digital resistance is really important. Electronic initiatives are very important. So I uh, will be brief. I will conclude. We need initiatives within the bigger context, which is the decentralization of the resistance uh, in the future. This is what we need, uh, and we need to be prepared. Thank you. Dr. Abdel Fattah. I will be talking about the media that was tackled by uh, Dr. So uh, digital resistance and resistance uh, that is electronic is ca uh, about countering the narrative of the Israelis. Uh, so there's the Israeli narrative uh, and press uh, uh, rights uh, and billions are being uh, spent uh, in order to uh, promote Zionism and promote the Israeli narrative. Uh, and this has always been the case since the very beginning of the Zionist project. Uh, without it, it wouldn't have been possible. And uh, I wanted to ask uh, Dr. Anis uh, regarding uh, this, uh, 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 regarding the exportation, exporting arms uh, for parties who use uh, arms or weapons against civilians. The international laws prohibit that, and to third parties as well. And the Israelis export to third parties uh, without uh, or in violation of this law. So to which extent we can um, press charges against the U.S. government uh, on the basis of uh, using the weapons against civilians and exporting to a third party by the Israelis. Thank you. Francesco, Francesco please. Okay. Uh, I'm not a lawyer or a political scientist, so I'm, unfortunately I'm a simple urban geographer or planner, so I cannot provide any meaningful solution on the specific problem of the ambassador. However, I would like to provide a simple comment on the general question. Is if I have well understood, the general question is what can we do? There are two problems with this question. The first one is what do we mean by we, okay? I, I think that in this room there are several interpretations of, of this we, which are legitimate. For many of you, the we is the Palestinian community. I cannot speak on behalf of the Palestinian or the Arab 
were because I'm not Arab or Palestinian, but I think that despite our origin, we should also try to focus on another type of we. So we as an academic community, and in particular as an academic community working in a serious and accurate way on this issue. Because I think if we take this point, we, we do not need to, in particular, to have political claims or rhetorics. What we have to develop, in particular in the West, and I can talk about the, the Western country, is we have to provide public opinion with, with understandable, reliable, and not biased descriptions of the problem. This is what is currently lacking in Europe. We, about Palestine, we just have biased political claims. In Italy, we don't have any kind of accurate description of the problem. Or we, or we are able to frame the, the, the problem in terms of description, discrimination, human rights, as Selma was stressing this morning. Otherwise, there is no effectiveness of the claims of the academic community. Since we are not just civil society, we are not politicians, I think that our task as academic community is to with very careful, reliable, non-biased, accurate facts. Because they are very, very powerful. And because on the other side, as my, the previous speaker was stressing, the Israeli pro-Israeli community is providing with very strong rhetoric. We do not need a counter-rhetoric. We need a counter-facts. We need just facts, because facts are in favor of the Palestinians. And this is the point of view, uh, for, for me, of the ontology of an academic community. The second problem is, it seems to me that the other task of the academic community is not providing, again, political claims, but to reframe the problem. I, I think that we don't... Uh, this morning we heard, we heard, and this day, uh, and today we heard a lot about uh, opinions, anal analysis, political statements, values, so on and so forth. We didn't hear so much about solutions. And the point is that in order to have a solution, we have to have a problem. At, at this stage, it seems to me that it's not clear what is the problem, or at least it's not shared what is the problem. Is the problem the occupation? Is the problem the lack of political control? Is the problem political discrimination? Is the problem the Israeli sovereignty or the lack of Palestinian sovereignty. These are not details, these are fundamentals, because if you want, as an academic community, provide, I would say, different solutions, we must need to know what is the specific problem. At this stage, it seems to me, even if I'm, again, I'm not within the Arab world, that at least among the, I would say, Palestinian world and Palestinian academics in Europe, the problem is not framing it. So with, I think we must also to reframe the problem before starting speaking about solution. Otherwise, we cannot frame solution without, before framing the problem. That's it. Frank Francisco. Mu'taz, Francisco. Bismillah ar rahim Mu'taz al-Masluhi, Bahad Qanuni, wa Ra'is al-Lajna al-Qanuni fi al-Mu'tamar al-Shaab al-Filistini al-Kharij. First of all, I second what um, Dr. Anis has said. The Trump statement is considered a very dangerous legal precedent in international law, and this is because for the first time since uh, the UN was established, the United States has declared itself an alternative to the UN. And you, the Trump's uh, uh, announcement uh, is, runs contrary to some 50 international laws and the legal opinions, Geneva Conventions agreements. Trump has called upon people or the countries uh, and this is uh, when and uh, this uh, decision has proven and sent a strong message against the Zionist entity and a recommendation to study the possibility of uh, abolishing 
this law and prove that uh, that uh, this law ran contrary to the to international law. Uh, and uh, in December to, uh, 2017, the uh, General Assembly decision uh, was uh, a victory for the UN as an organization, not for the Palestinian people because 138 countries voted for that and we must utilize this in order to restore international peace and stability, like what Dr. Anis has said. And, uh, and also, uh, we should deal intelligently with the United, United States to annul the American veto. And this is the first choice. The second choice, the, interna the General Assembly's exceptional, except extraordinary session is still on, and we must call on it to, to sever relations with the Zionist entity, because the Zionist entity is breaking the international law and insisting on moving the embassy and also we must press the Palestinian authority to approach the international court and also to create uh, some backing amongst the people for this move. Thank you very much. I just wanted to refer to what Dr. Ibrahim has said. Uh, there is Burj al Ta'awun, Dali Foundations. Uh, they do microfinancing projects, uh, especially in uh, Jerusalem. But uh, I think the el Palestinian elites uh, in the diaspora, uh, they can do something. The elites inside are linked to the status quo, and we, our job is to uh, support the marginalized communities, but ultimately this will not mean much without a political solution. And in addition to what Dr. Francesco has said, there has been a lot of research. Uh, like It was like an attempt to, to deal with the PLO and how we can reactivate its well, this can be a long-term solution because at the end of the day we can help, we can do microfinancing. This is all good and well, but it will not uh, uh, solve the political crisis. And decentralization can help in the short run, but we want a political platform for the long run. Yes, regarding the legal strand is excellent and undoubtedly it's necessary, but uh, it's apparent that it's long term and complicated and uh, requires a lot of resources and political will, of course, comes on top of that. And without that, the situation will remain to be very difficult, especially when it comes to to trying to uh, hunt down, as they say, legally individuals is very difficult. But nonetheless, the Palestinians and their helpers and supporters in all continents have managed huge leaps in the social media. And I remember in London and in Europe, the social media has played an important role in exposing the Israeli activities and pushed people onto the streets to demonstrate against that. I think our problem is true. There is a problem when it comes to moving the embassy to Jerusalem, but the embassy can be moved to Jerusalem 
but I don't think there will be any practical outcomes on the ground regarding the Palestinian rights. The problem, in my opinion, is a purely Palestinian problem. The Israeli approach to Oslo in 1993 came under fire in 1993, you remember. After the intifada of the stone-throwing children pushed the Europeans, the Americans, and the Israelis, and in brackets, the Palestinian official authority, they all found themselves in a dilemma, and therefore they resorted to Oslo. Also, the withdrawal of Israel's from uh, Gaza by, uh, uh, by Sharon. I personally heard him saying that Netzarim was, in his eyes, similarly to uh, Tel Aviv, but he had to withdraw from But Trump wants to take uh, Jerusalem off the table, but, but the, who, who can keep uh, uh, Jerusalem on the table is the Palestinian Authority. The Palestinian Authority is not allowing the Palestinians to do so. Our anger is not against the embassy as a building. The Palestinian Authority is involved and complicit in losing Jerusalem. Those who can can really put an end to Israeli policies and American policies are the Palestinians themselves. If these people realize that there is pain caused to them by the Palestinians, similarly to what happened in the first Intifada, the world felt that. So therefore, there were all this shuttle diplomacy, all these visits uh, to and from Palestine so we must try we must try to disengage we we want divorce from this catholic marriage marriage 25 years for us is a killer and wasted a lot of our rights now the palestinians are shackled no matter how you justify this marriage is no longer viable the palestinians and the and must, we must have a general trend which uh, goes beyond the factions and uh, takes initiative from the current Palestinian leadership and uh, we will lose everything and the Americans will go even further in their plans. Thank you, all of you, all the panelists, for their contributions. Uh, they're all excellent contributions. Without underestimating the legal aspect, without underestimating the legal uh, I don't think we can get a, a resolution or a decision better than the one pertaining to the wall. And that decision is there. We do not need any more decision. There is enough the Security Council resolutions, the uh, International Criminal Court, um, I think, I think uh, now, in my opinion, the legal aspect is very important from a moral point of view, that raising morale is important, yes, but uh, if it's to be an alternative to political work, 
This is uh, the work of uh, helpless and hopeless people. It should be complementary to political strategies, not an alternative to maybe in the period of the absence of political strategies, you can fill in the uh, gap by legal works. But it should not be a long-term alternative to political strategy. In the case of Jerusalem, the political will is there for the Israelis and there is uh, consensus in Israel of annex in Jerusalem. What is happening now, I used to read about 20 years ago and the maps that they are implementing now, I saw with my own eyes 20 years ago. And on the E1, I organized a press conference in E1 15 years ago, I organized a press conference. Now they are implementing E1. So the Israelis plan, they have a plan, they are very persistent, they are implementing. The, and uh, I think the Arab side uh, is confused. Uh, I'll give you an example. Maybe a week ago, the foreign minister of Oman visited Al-Aqsa. I could hardly read any news item on that. If another country like Egypt, Kuwait, or uh, Egypt, or Qatar visit, made that visit, then the whole world would have turned upside down. What he did was not for the sake of Jerusalem, because the Oman has no disagreements and has no political rivals, nobody, nobody objected. But if it was another country with uh, uh, rivalries and competition, then the situation would have been different. The question is not Jerusalem. It's inter-Arab factionalism and differences. It's very obvious there is no strategy to face up an Israeli strategy, which is, on the other hand, is there, it is planned, it's carefully considered. And I don't think Netanyahu would waste this opportunity. Uh, sometimes the situation is depicted as another foolhardy action by Trump, but it's not like that. Uh, the decision came years after a Congress uh, uh, by partisan decision, the Republicans and the Democrats. So both parties are with the decision. So here, uh, Trump is not acting upon his own whim and whimsical desires. What used to block or obstruct the, the this implementation of this decision was the White House itself. Now the White House is occupied by a populist president who wants to implement this decision. So it's not just Trump, but Netanyahu also constitutes a danger here. And this decision, according to American strategy and Israeli strategy, this decision will be implemented because nobody is going to hinder an opportunity like this. I think we should take what Nikki Haley said seriously when she said we took this decision and nothing happened. So have we thought why nothing has not happened? It's obvious that the vacuum of nothing happening is leading to this discussion about legal aspects and others. But why has nothing happened? Or maybe something happened, but it was very little compared to the enormity of the case and the cause. Some people think that uh, uh, intifadas or uprisings are a spontaneous thing. No, this, the intifadas were not spontaneous, and the first one especially was very well organized. All the factions uh, got together, they agreed, they set plans, and also the second one was organized by the Palestinian Authority, by Yasser Arafat and those who are at him. Now, the people are ready, but they could not find anyone to organize them. I don't want to get into a discussion whether 
the, the balance of power allows for for an intifada or not. I took part in the second intifada, but uh, but uh, the results of that were not uh, in the f in favor of the Palestinian people, unlike the first intifada. But it's obvious uh, that uh, political leaders in Palestine are not. Uh, prepare to organize anything, neither in Jerusalem nor anywhere else. But maybe in Jerusalem, when people demonstrated against the, the electronic gates, they, these were spontaneous because they are limited, they are based on specific needs. This kind of need can be spontaneous, but a strategic struggle, long-term struggle against an occupation, this cannot be borne by the Jerusalem people. To leave, leave them to the Jerusalemites is impossible. We cannot, we, 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 all that we can expect from the people of Jerusalem is to remain steadfast and not to immigrate and leave the city. But at the Palestinian level, the Arab level, there were no intents, no will, no strategy. So therefore, if we want to talk real politics here and correct political things, we must leave this. Of course, there are other things we can do as academicians, as legal experts, as uh, rights defenders, but the main case remains, and that is there should be a political will for confrontation. Apart from some details we can work on at the level of defending rights or legal rights or media to fill in the gaps until such day that uh, political will is there. I just want to add one more point, one more point. In this current uh, situation, there is discussion on whether the solution should be based on two states or one state. I think it should be three states. This discussion is just to escape escape uh, reality. Now, after each round we have a for national reconciliation uh, which ends in failure, the vision, the vision will, will be more established, entrenched. We have two pantostans similar to what was in South Africa. If the situation remains at as, as it is, we cannot have a strategy to struggle against occupation or apartheid or call it what you wish. We'll be kidding each other. If any of us thinks we can set forth a strategy, because each step, any demonstration, any announcement, any statement, any sitting, will this. If Hamas did and Fatah disagrees, then we cannot get very far and vice versa. We cannot have a Palestinian strategy to face up to occupation and apartheid. This cannot be achieved for as long as there are two authorities. And people of the two authorities, Hamas and the PA in Gaza or the West Bank, they bear the responsibilities, and if, unless they change their positions, we cannot uh, sit and talk and do everything. But at the end of the day, we'll all remain where we are. We, we try here in America and Britain everywhere, but this is not an alternative to a political leadership similarly to that in Israel or the United States. Because a political leadership should, so, so, until that day, all what we can do, apart from all these good ideas that you floated, all what we can do is remain steadfast and stand our ground. I cannot see any solutions. All what we can do is the Arabs should remain living around the Aqsa 
they should continue living, continue building schools, hospitals, and protect their national identity. In West Bank and Gaza, they should try and be there, build uh, establishments. And uh, at the end of the struggle in, in South Africa, even this establishment in the stands proved useful because they produced cadres that led the, the struggle. So when you the apartheid system that and the people and the professionals these institutions have produced help run the country. But the condition should be nobody should in the meantime should get up and sign a deal on an agreement because once somebody signs any agreements then we we'll lose everything we must remain saying no no to the israeli occupation no to annex in jerusalem nobody should come forward for someone to take Abu Mazen's place and says yes i'll sign and accept because History teaches us that uh, power struggles within Arab uh, political systems always settled at the expense of the national cause. And maybe uh, there are people around uh, Mahmoud Abbas, Abu Mazen, who would be competing with each other, who would serve Israel more just to, to get uh, to uh, replace him when he goes. So we must have have this political strategy. Before that, I can't really see anything <coughs> apart from what we can do and develop that further. Thank you, Dr. Bshara. Thank you. So, in reality, what I heard now uh, from the different parties takes us back to the initial stages uh, of the case and redefining uh, the concepts. We are people under occupation. We have been occupied for 70 years. Whether we're talking about the 1948 or the remaining parts of the West Bank, Using other definitions led us to this maze that, that is all about uh, negotiations and negotiations and more negotiations. The party agreed to Oslo. In Oslo, we know that the most important commitment, and one of the speakers actually touched upon it, is that it transformed a revolution from a revolution fighting the occupation to a tool to protect the occupation and the settlers. And, uh, oppressing any individual who thinks of facing this occupation. All of this was linked to interests, VIP tickets, VIP uh, reception, and for 25 years the territories have become less and less, and the authorities of the Palestinian Authority and the powers of the Palestinian Authority was in decline. In March, uh, the coordination, uh, the regional coordination, is leading with the Palestinian people uh, directly without going through the DCO and coordination officers. Even themselves, they recognize this. And there are the other party that is resisting. So he wants to protect uh, the entity the fighters, the people, and then there was the uh, separation and the division that we are still suffering from, uh, that we hate. I have personally, part I personally partook in um, negotiations in Cairo and uh, all the parties that represented the Palestinian Authority and Fatah. We were very clear come together to put together a national strategy to fight occupation, not necessarily using uh, uh, attacks or bombs, uh, but uh, we need 
to find an agreement. We need to face this occupation, the settlers, the settlements. We need a working plan. We need an action plan. We escalate and de-escalate as we have seen appropriate. And we have given several opportunities for ceasefire and uh, uh, cessation of aggressions uh, and hostilities in order for Abu Mazen and Mahmoud Abbas to uh, get a chance when it comes to the negotiation. The problem uh, of also is a burden on the shoulders of Abu Mazen. I want to say that they have good intentions, but they cannot to uh, do away with the repercussions of these conditions. The other party offered after winning the elections, just imagine elections under the occupation in 2006 and the result was clear, and then they turned against the results. And uh, they told you, I don't want the majority in the parliament, I don't want uh, to be prime minister, I don't want a majority. I want you to be the president, but let us become one country, one institution, people against the occupation. Mahmoud Abbas uh, wants uh, one legal, legitimate authority to carry the weapons in the West Bank and Gaza. I asked my colleague uh, uh, about uh, the details uh, of uh, what they needed. For example, Ismail Haniya uh, needed to, to be arrested because he went against legitimacy and he implemented uh, uh, regulations uh, uh, against the legitimacy. This is when I will be empowered, being able to arrest him. We go all over the world, all over the capital cities of the world, and we say we want to save our country. Let us come together. The meeting of the Central Council, let us make it outside Ramallah in order to allow for the participation of everybody. And the refusal was always or had always one source. <laughs> I'm talking about uh, putting them or holding them both responsible. Uh, the two parties being responsible needs to be revisited. Some people offered concessions, but they are not ready to put an end to the resistance. This is why we are saying to Hamas that the weapons of the resistance uh, are a red line that cannot be subject to concession. I am with all sorts of resistance, uh, the media, economic, uh, the counter-narrative, the uh, boycott of Israeli products, all of this serves and helps. However, it also needs uh, to be uh, paralleled with uh, raising the cost of the occupation. When the occupation fears they are losing, even by throwing rocks, Dr. Azmi knows how much of the rocks influenced settlers. Thousands left the West Bank and left their settlements. The occupation needs to pay, the world needs to feel that Israel is a burden for the international community and the people. And then, just like uh, what happened in South Africa, they start talking about apartheid regime, etc. Dr. Ahmed Hussain. So, in addition to this colonial uh, project uh, that helps. Uh, transform the uh, settlers uh, into peaceful citizens with no resistance. Uh, this is the project. It is a colonial project that uh, wishes or intends to get rid of the people of Palestine, particularly the West Bank and uh, the Gaza Strip. Uh, after this declaration, uh, as uh, academics, uh, we need to focus in the absence of an, an Arab strategy. We need to focus on uh, resistance and uh, uh, the struggle staying there. It is a very key part uh, of uh, national resistance uh, and uh, uh, practicing this uh, 
a form of resistance it can take two uh, shapes. First of all, uh, the resident uh, survivor was supported by the Palestinian Authority, by the uh, reinforcing the presence in the occupied territories. The second aspect that can be key to any national project, uh, uh, national Palestinian project, the uh, resistance uh, uh, actually providing, uh, which means that providing the capability of the residents of uh, Palestine in general and uh, Jerusalem in particular, building a socio-economic uh, network capable of facing the occupation force and uh, it needs to go in parallel where the systems of the occupation force. So the first aspect is um, subsidizing or supporting and the uh, residents there. It might actually help uh, foster uh, dependence on the subsidies, talking about whether there is uh, money or there is no money. However, when it comes to the resistance that is uh, founded on a socio-economic base, particularly the doctor mentioned that the people all over the Arab world and in the Palestinian territories have rallied against this decision, but it is not organized, and this will help uh, actually strengthen this form of resistance. In general, the people of the Palestinian territories and Jerusalem in particular, by building a social economic base, presents a, it's a, a social network, a social safety net that would uh, be facing any attacks by the uh, occupying force. And the networking with the international community is very important, of course. So the resistance, uh, this resistance might face uh, several uh, difficulties and uh, now we can talk about the uh, Oslo agreement over and over again because it allowed the colonial force to transform, to transform us in the West Bank to peaceful uh, uh, residents uh, giving some sort of legitimacy <coughs> the occupation that was through the strong uh, force or the soft power uh, Antonio Gramsci said uh, that uh, the colonial force controls the cultural aspect of any country and prohibits uh, the creation of their own culture they link all the residents all the people all the individuals uh, subjected to that to their culture and they control the resources and they present a narrative these colonial forces present a narrative and prohibit any counter narrative based on knowledge that uh, would uh, shed light on the occupation and colonialism so we can focus on this form of resistance as key to any future project. Should we have a clear strategy, Palestinian strategy after this division? Thank you. Um, yeah, so I, what I wanted to, to say is that I agree with many of the comments that have been made uh, thus far. And I just wanted to add a couple of points. So I think that um, it was Francesco who, who asked us, when we're talking, when we ask the question, what should we do, uh, we haven't necessarily defined exactly what the problem is, exactly that we're searching for a solution for, and that it's necessary to ask what's the, actually the problem. And then I think um, Dr. Azmi pretty much answered that question by saying, you know, that it's a lack of um, political leadership in large part because of the lack of unity and a lack of a political program. <coughs> and this is obviously an enormous problem. <laughs> and unless there is a, a, le a leadership and a political program that people can adhere to, really there's, that's a prerequisite, it seems to me, for any other possible strategies or work, serious work to take place. Um, and I know that the, the suggestion was that therefore in the meantime we should focus on how best to build institutions on the ground wherever we are and kind of remain living and, and steadfast and so on until 
such a day when a leadership emerges and until such a time that um, you know the conditions are right to to do some something else and I think that that's all well and good and I would just wanted to add two practical sort of practical points or things that we at least could think about doing in the meantime which might be useful is this on okay um yeah <laughs> the first is i think i'm 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 saying this particularly to the academic community which i don't consider myself to be part of so for those of you who are involved in research and think tanks and so on i think it, the first thing it would be useful to do, and this is, in fact, across the board, is to accept that we are in a one-state situation when it comes to Israel-Palestine, in the sense that we have one Israeli regime that is in control of the whole territory in various different ways, whether we like it or not. That should be our starting point. And so I think focusing, for example, on the US embassy maybe moving to Jerusalem, West Jerusalem. I agree, as some of the other commentators have said, it's, to me, it's a red herring. It doesn't really matter, because whether the move is made or not, it recognizes the reality that's been in place and that Israel has been consolidating for many years now. So my, from, for the academic community, given that that's our starting point, we are in a one-state reality, I would like to see more work being done, and forgive me if it is being done, I might be ignorant about it, more work being done on studying what are the, given this one state reality, given that it doesn't look like we have the power to change it anytime in the near future, and this may be the reality that the outcome we end up with, what is the best way for us to maximize our chances of firstly surviving this reality, and secondly, hopefully eventually thriving in that reality? What are the scenarios? What are the potential scenarios that could unfold here? And what are the tactics and strategies that could help promote this objective of surviving and thriving, given these different scenarios? And those things can be modeled. And if they have been modeled already, I'm sorry, maybe they have. But they should be, because I think that when a political leadership eventually emerges, at least the work and that research will have been done. And it will be, it, and in other words, it might be easier to then run with a new political program if the groundwork has already been done by the academics and the think tanks. And I just, a little aside, it reminds me of what they say about Margaret Thatcher who came to power in the United Kingdom as a prime minister in, the 19, in 1980. And she immediately was able to start implementing a very right-wing ideological program that took everyone by surprise. And the reason she was able to do that is because for two decades or so before she came into power, there were all of these right-wing think tanks who were doing the work. They were laying the groundwork, they had modeled things, they had come up with the strategies and the policies and she could just run with them. So I, that's the first thing to say is, understand that we're in a one-state reality whether we like it or not, and can we start planning the different scenarios that might as a, as a result from that. And the second thing very briefly is, in the meantime as well, I, you know, I think, you know, for my, my sense of it, maybe because of my own circumstances being born abroad and everything, I look at our situation and I think that the solution can only come from building links with one another, with our different constituencies. So the Palestinians in the diaspora be having closer connections with those in the West Bank and Gaza and those in Jerusalem and those in the 48 areas. Even if that's not going to happen on the level, on the official level, for good reason perhaps, couldn't there be more efforts to mobilize and build grassroots organizations that at least explicitly represent all Palestinian constituencies? And in that way, uh, you know, at the very least, we start to shift the paradigm and understand ourselves as being reunited as one, as a one people and then we understand the Israeli regime in its different facets. But this fragmentation between us, not just between Hamas and Fatah, but between, between all of us, you know, isn't gonna ha is not helpful. And I think a lot can be done on, on the unofficial level, even if an unofficial, the offic official politics can catch up with that. So that, that's my two suggestions. <laughs> I have three 
minutes remaining and I have three speakers uh, who have already requested. One minute, Dr. Khalil. <laughs> 30 seconds already <laughs> when it comes to building the institutions uh, to allow for this resistance in Jerusalem, uh, we were discussing a very sensitive issue, the movement of the embassy, uh, who led the latest battle, the latest battle was led by the people. 24 hours uh, there was a religious authority and then the people and even the last day on Friday uh, morning we watched the Israeli soldiers uh, operating within uh, Jerusalem and we thought uh, that uh, there would be a massacre there would be a massacre but overnight there was a meeting of ambassadors uh, because of the pressure that was exerted the soft power that was used and uh, there was some sort of leadership some sort of guidance before the organization of the islamic and national forces i have talked with my colleagues regarding the economic aspect so we need to focus uh, on this aspect. Uh, Jerusalem uh, is uh, our pillar, and uh, any building in Jerusalem uh, is more important than any in Jerusalem is more important than any other building uh, everywhere else because Israel considers Jerusalem its historical uh, capital city. So. In reality, discuss, we are discussing or we were discussing today the embassy and moving the embassy to Jerusalem. Uh, that was the title of uh, our conference. Jerusalem, in the presence of uh, its resident, you can talk about Jerusalem, but uh, without the presence of its resident, uh, forget about everything. Israel wants Jerusalem, and that's it. Thank you. So it is a comprehensive process uh, as a person, uh, as an individual who lives in Jerusalem and uh, listens to some of the speeches that are really beautiful, that are really motivational and really encouraging. But the question is, uh, are we capable of uh, implementing this? It is actually wrong to ask uh, the prisoner to free the person who is not imprisoned. So there is a structural mistake. We need to understand the objective, ever-changing situation. The uh, Arab uh, Palestinians uh, in Israel, uh, for example, Nazareth, uh, the metropolitan Nazareth, uh, the presence uh, is there. Jerusalem needs, uh, needs to be taken into account from Bir Zayt to Beit Fajar. There is a majority of Palestinians. So how to read this and how to deal with this? It needs political will. When we discuss the tools and the methods, we need to build a society. We do not need more individuals. We do not need more elite that will be subject to corruption. One of the key issues uh, that we are facing uh, that uh, the leadership is uh, on a different level, riding a different wave. The citizen does not trust the leadership. And building this trust again is very important in order to empower the citizens and in addition to that, ethics is re are really important. Uh, one of the key problematic issues uh, when it comes to the uh, Israelis, uh, they talk about empowerment and they talk about uh, their 
projects, uh, but we need to talk about what's moral and what's not. We need to use the correct words in order for the world to understand it as Palestinians living in Palestine and to use the clear and right terminology. So how, the last point is, how can we transform our suffering into a point of leverage? Our colleague over there talked a very about a very a problematic issue. I personally, for example, uh, see how to build an institution, how to carry on. However, some other people come and accuse me of uh, being uh, or coordinating with the Israelis, of normalizing the relations with Israel. However, the people who are living there have a different situation to deal with. And the other point is how to produce a knowledge base that is very important and the elite need to be at the service of the people in order to create this leadership that needs to be activated. I, brother Khalil, uh, recently, when it was the issue of Gates, he was part of the leadership and he was uh, shouting and uh, he talked about civil resistance is very important. Some people are waiting for me to throw a rock in order to achieve their objectives. I need to understand the balance of power in order to benefit. <coughs> I would like to end by saying this is a long process. This is why creating expectations and it is an operation that might lead to frustration and disappointment. A disappointment uh, might be created. We need to manage our expectations. Uh, there is one additional question, uh, particularly when it comes to uh, men of law and academia and the uh, strategy of justice uh, and uh, this cumulative process in order to influence the Israeli government. Uh, we also touch upon the, the international law and uh, we need to cover this aspect uh, as well. Israel, Israel deals uh, in terms of the local or domestic law we can talk about our capacity to develop uh, the international law in order to strengthen and develop and uh, foster the communication between the residents. Jerusalem today is 320,000. It's different than uh, Jerusalem with 450 and 500,000. We need to develop this national local leadership that is responsible, knows what its responsibilities are and without using uh, uh, the terminology that is not practical we don't want any disappointment and frustration thank you uh, only because I want to give him one minute because they requested Okay. There are many suggestions. The question is who will uh, hang the bell? I think two years ago we were discussing at the, in the Arab Center the Palestinian National Project. So where is the Palestinian National Project? Now I want to speak freely from academia and uh, uh, I'm, I live in America and it's the second arena where, where, where uh, of confrontation with Israel. You talk about the mosquito cut, I remind you of the 1,000 cuts and what the Israeli lobby is prepared to do 
against any Palestinian action in America. I spent 12 years uh, struggling to get my nationality, and in the end, I dropped the case because there was no case. And the foundation for the defense of democracy was fi financed by the Emirates, and they raised my, my case twice. So you have two opponents, an Israeli and an Arab uh, also. Pessimism is not a solution, but I think before we start building castles in the air, Francesco, yeah. When you said, who are we, it's true, and I agree with him. And these texts that are available, the other side has a project. Last week, for example, there was an Islamic conference. In Abdullah bin Bayya, a famous Muslim scholar, the conference was financed by the UAE. And, uh, and a special meeting was arranged for him to celebrate the Sabbath. I have no qualms with that. But the problem is when a scholar comes and meets with the, with the, and all his program is to do with the mosques, imams, and now, now they are working to establish a parallel leadership for Muslims in the United States. So we have an opponent in Palestine, we have an opponent in the Arab world, and now we want to wonder why the other side is beating us. Of course they are beating us. We, I have no problems with other problems. I cannot, of course, I cannot forget about other cases. I cannot think of Palestine when the, what's happening in Ghouta is happening. But thank you very much, Osama. At the end of this session, I, I just want to mention the fact that when Dr. Azmi suggested uh, organizing this, uh, we, we, were, we were not expecting a vision and a strategy, at least this is an academic, an Arab academic uh, institution. At least we should have a discussion uh, on a case as important as Jerusalem. And you see, maybe in 70 years, the reaction at the official level, I don't want to talk about at the official level, at, at least at the popular level, at the, the Palestinian cause and the Jerusalem, in particular, is unanimously agreed on by Arabs. We d disagree on everything else, but the Palestinian cause, at least, is uh, what unites us, supposedly. The reactions were um, a lot less than what was expected, and I think uh, if you try to bring together uh, academicians and pose questions like what w we can do and what should be done. At least uh, this uh, Dr. Rasim said something very important in my opinion and th the, this is a, a long term struggle. This, this almost 100 years old, it can be another 100 years, but uh, maybe if we agree on certain things today, at least in the absence of a proper strategy, we must provide for people on the ground in Jerusalem to remain there and uh, stand their ground. We talked about legal aspects, media and others. And until such day that this strategy is uh, born, at least. I, once again, I'm sure we will hold more uh, events like this whether on this uh, issue or others relate on other relating issues. At the end of the day, I want to thank you all for all your efforts, whether through presenting papers or I think 
We're going on for almost nine hours. You're all tired. So thank you very much for your participation. We hope by the will of God that we have managed to do something, even if it's too little. Thank you very much.